Sports about the latest news in the Idaho legislature. Now here are Paul J and Chris on 670 KBOI. At top of the morning, it's 839. Our guest on Minority Friday, Ilana Rubel, the representative, uh, assistant minority leader from District 18. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. District 18, you're a Boisean, huh? I am indeed. Southeast Boise. What's keeping you up at night in the legislature right now? <laughs> Well, I wasn't too happy about the action taken yesterday by the House Education Committee to strike a bunch of the standards from the, uh, the Idaho Science Standards for our public schools. Uh, they struck any reference to climate change. They struck references to biodiversity, any impact humans have on animal habitat. Uh, they, they struck some pretty basic scientific facts from what our kids are going to learn. So that's certainly one thing. And uh, did they strike these uh, scientific facts uh, purely for political reasons? I think they did. Yeah. And I think it's not doing our kids a service to send them out in the world not learning uh, established scientific facts. I think our kids aren't going to be able to compete with kids in other states who are learning about reality. What else uh, in, in terms of education, funding education, improving education in Idaho, is uh, the uh, legislature working on? Or what would you like to see them working on? Well, I have I have another concern right now, which is uh, House Bill 67, which is the, the, uh, the tax cut bill brought by Mike Moyle that passed the House and has been sent over to the Senate. We're waiting to see what the Senate will do with it. Uh, this is one... It's kind of a classic tax cut for the rich that's really going to jeopardize a funding for a lot of things, schools, roads, you name it. Um, it, it basically, when you look at where the dollars go, practically nothing goes to people in the middle class. It, nothing goes to working families. If you're in the, you know, if you're in the lower 20%, you get $4 a year. Mm -hmm. If you're in the lower 40th percentile, you get $17 a year. And your average middle class family will get $32 a year. Now, if you're on the top end, if you're making over $400,000 a year, that's when you get the real bucks out of this tax cut. That's ah. when you get thousands of dollars in tax cuts. But the, the impact is we, we think it's going to take about $58 million out of the budget. Uh, which is going to punch a hole in any efforts we might want to take on education or fixing our roads or a lot of other really important criteria. I've heard that we have a surplus right now, but is this just a way to eliminate any surplus in the future? Um, yeah, I think the, the surplus looks a little bit illusory, if you will. Uh, and we, there are a lot of really unknown factors, so I think we're really jumping the gun by even thinking we have a real surplus right now. Uh, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed, for example, mm -hmm. that is going to punch a hole in our budget you could drive a truck through. I mean, that's going to be many tens of millions of dollars. We know for a fact we're going to have to come up with an extra $22 million just for the catastrophic fund, but it's going to really put us in a budget crunch. We're going to lose $220 million a year on subsidies for our health exchange if that repeal goes through. So there is so much uncertainty right now, you know, just on the healthcare front, much less, you know, our growth has been overshooting projections. We right. overshot the career ladder by $8 million this year just by more kids being in school. Uh, so I don't think there's even a surplus there to the tune of what they think there is to be giving away. Um, but, uh, but once that's gone, I don't know how many people realize we had that surplus eliminator yeah. to fix our roads last year. No surplus, no surplus eliminator, no fixed roads. Exactly. And then we just end up waiting for the next year to show up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we're not going to have that was, I think, $95 million that, that got us fixed roads last year. And that's not going to be there. State of education in the state of Idaho right now, despite things that, uh, you know, yesterday, like climate change, et cetera. Um, how do you view it? What needs to be done? Great question. We've done some really good things over the last few years, and I'm really proud of the steps we've been taking, but they're just not enough. You know, we were we were so far behind. Our teachers were at starting salaries of 31000 which was just a joke. And now we're creeping upwards. We're getting more toward 35, uh, which is great, great move, um, but still woefully inadequate. All the states around us, you know, Wyoming's paying 43, Oregon's paying at 38, 39. Um, we're, we're nowhere competitive to the states around us. So, so border towns in Idaho just can't keep their teachers for anything. 
Uh, so K-12, we have a lot of problems. We still have a lot of school districts on four-day weeks. Higher education, we didn't do anything on. For the last few years, we just said, okay, you know, you get to the back of the line. We'll deal with you later. We're going to worry about K-12 for now. And now, finally, this year, the, the governor is convening a task force to deal with higher education and deal with all those tuition hikes and our poor go-on rate and all of that. First meeting is today. And I'm really worried that we're going to strip away every bit of money that would be in the budget to deal with that before we have even had our first meeting. <laughs> San Francisco, of course, in the last few days announced that they're going to offer for San Francisco residents free community college. Now, we have some community colleges in Idaho. What would we have to do to be able to afford to do that? Or, or, well, or, or have the will be there? Yeah, that that's a long shot. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, but I think you know we we can look at things short of that to at least make it affordable for those who need it. Um, and th th that's one of the things we really need to examine. And I'm one of the members of the task force on education. Uh, but we have a terrible go on rate right now. We have a terrible rate of people getting post secondary diplomas, and it doesn't have to be a four year diploma. You know, a certificate. Or, but they say like that, yeah. exactly associate's degree. There there are a lot of you know things in the trades that 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 really would be helpful. Um, but but the experts say we need to have 60% of our population with those diplomas, and right now we're at 35%. They say 60% by the year 2020. That's three years from now mm -hmm. for us to be economically competitive, and we're nowhere close. Okay, we are talking with Representative Alana Rubel this morning, uh, from, uh, Assistant Minority Leader from District 18. KBOI News Time 845, Hollingshead Eye Center, writer. <laughs> That's because... Uh, Ilana Rubel is here from the Idaho State Legislature, from the House. She's the House Assistant Minority Leader. It's Minority Friday. Let's uh, let's talk about a little bit about criminal justice reform. Yeah. Uh, what does the Idaho criminal justice system need most right now? Uh, well, I'm, I'm very, very excited on this topic. Uh, I've got a couple bills coming on Monday. And the wonderful thing about this is it's really a great area for bipartisan cooperation. Uh, so the two bills that I'm, I'm bringing on Monday, both are – one of them I'm bringing with one of the most conservative members of the House, Steve Harris, civil asset forfeiture reform. Uh, this was an area, and, and, and uh, we're working with the Freedom Foundation and the ACLU on this one. Well, so goodness sakes. Exactly. It's just where the two ends of the spectrum just meet around, come straight around the earth uh, and meet I, on the I, other I side. I knew it was a circle somehow. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting area that's really been getting a lot of national attention. I was pretty shocked when I looked at the statute and what it allows right now. Basically, it allows – law enforcement to take any property that is anywhere near drugs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to have been connected to the drugs. doesn't or, need to be or, proceeds. Or purchased with drug money. It yeah. doesn't need to be purchased. The standard is proximity. Uh, and they can take anything. They can take your money. They can take your computer, your clothes, your anything at all. You don't, not needless to say the whole car. And, and what is the proximity? Do I have to make sure my next door neighbors aren't selling drugs? <laughs> well, I mean, there's some concern. They can take ah. a, a container, which could mean your house. In addition to your car, uh, they don't need to, you don't need to be convicted of a crime. You don't even need to be charged with a crime, and law enforcement can just keep it. Yeah, that, and it that, doesn't, that, that mm -hmm. doesn't seem fair, does it? No, okay. no. So it really offends our notions of due process. So we're looking to reform that. Um, another one that I'm bringing, and this sort of this, this sort of flowed out of the first one because uh -huh. I was meeting with people about civil asset forfeiture, and a lot of folks said, "Oh, great! I'm really glad you're working on that." But let me tell you what really needs to happen. We really need to work on mandatory sentencing minimums for drug offenses. I'm guessing that wasn't Steve Harris. No, I'm working on that one with Christy Perry, though, another gotcha. Republican. Oh, all right. Um, and this is one, you know, again, where there are – I think it's really a, re a relic of the, the war on drugs era, and I'm not a fan of drugs at all. But looking at the criminal justice code, it really does not make any sense right now. There are only three offenses that I could find in the code that carry any real sentencing minimums. It's uh, child molestation, killing someone while drunk driving, and drug offenses. Uh, everything else, judges have discretion. They can look at, you know, well, was it a violent so, offense? Was it, so you know, triple homicide? It's up to the judge. It's up to the judge. Uh -huh. It's up to the judge on pretty much everything: rape, murder, bank robbery, embezzlement. You name it. Um, it's up to the judge to look at the particulars of a case and decide. But boy, you get a drug offense, zero discretion. You are going away for five years, no matter what, and that can really ruin lives. Uh, so, so whether you're token marijuana on a street corner. Or selling cocaine to little kids, 
or bringing stuff from Canada to uh, uh, give to people who can't afford what they're uh, being prescribed. Right, and I heard there was a, a dad on my kid's soccer team who's a public defender who was telling me once while we were watching the game about this case he had of a guy who, who ran a, a perfectly legal dispensary in Washington State and was driving into Idaho to go to a friend's wedding or something and had just forgotten to take his inventory out of the uh -oh. back of his car. He was just driving in for the day, planning to drive right back out, no plans to sell in Idaho, but he got pulled over and he he got caught with that volume of drugs in the back of his car, and he is going to prison for years and years, and there is not one thing they can do about it because it's just mandatory. Uh, and so I think we should just give judges a little discretion back. Maybe, they don't, maybe they'll decide it still is the right thing to lock these people up, but at least they can make a case-by-case -case decision. Meanwhile, clean out your cars, people. Yes. <laughs> okay. Is there support for that bill, do you think? Well, I really hope so. I'm going to have an introductory hearing on Monday, and we'll see where that goes. Um, but I think it would really uh, improve a lot of lives in the state of Idaho. Let's talk about the con con. Oh, yes. Well, that should be fun. One of my favorite issues. Just tell us about it. This is another one where, where the right and left are meeting, and I'm working with another very conservative legislator on it, Judy Boyle. We just published an article in the paper on that one. Um, the con con is the thing that should be keeping people up at night, but it's so wonky, so many people don't know about it. Little background, there's there's two ways you can change the Constitution. You can do the traditional amendment way where you propose an amendment and, and Congress votes on it and it goes around to all the states for ratification and everybody sees the language and they know exactly what they're voting on. And that's the only way any our Constitution has ever been amended. Right. But then there's this other kind of X factor that's never been tried, which is to have a constitutional convention where you can just rewrite anything. It's just basically starting over as if it were 1787 again. And this has never been done since 1787, and no one quite knows what it would look like or what would happen. But there's a big push for it to happen right now. There's a lot of folks in Idaho pushing for Idaho to sign on to this. We are dangerously close to it happening. When 34 states call for it, it has to happen. Congress has no discretion. They have to order one. We're at 28 states right now. And there's a big push this year to close the last six states to move us to a CONCON. And and that, sorry, con con being short for constitutional convention. Um, and uh, this this scares the daylights out of me because it's just terrifying. Who knows what we would lose or what would come in or out of our constitution? And I feel like it's served us pretty darn well for, you know, 230 years. And, uh, and, and we are really playing with fire and opening that up to a completely unknown rewrite process. So apparently we don't think we're arguing enough at the moment. <laughs> One can scarcely imagine what that would look like when we're dealing with a constitutional rewrite. Exactly. So yeah, that's, I, a, that's a funny one because uh, the fences move around when you start talking about constitutional conventions. Right. Because there are a lot of uh, people on the right who are constitutionalists really like that. And then there's a lot of people on the left who also don't think it should be messed with. Uh, that's interesting to see what would happen in that case. Right. And, and as you are, said, scary. Very scary. And there are folks on both sides. You know, some folks on the left think it would be great because we could get rid of the, you know, the uh, get the popular vote instead of the Electoral College and maybe get rid of Citizens United. There are folks on the right that think they could get in a constitutional, you know, gay marriage ban or an abortion ban or who knows what else. But nobody knows what will come out of this. And I think we got to just stick with the Constitution we've got. All right. Thanks. Delano Rubel has been our guest. What does being Idaho's...